Hey everyone, I'm David Butler. I'm Grace Freeman. Welcome to Don't Miss This. It's our scripture study podcast where we point out things from the scriptures that we think you don't want to miss. So if you're listening or watching, welcome. We are in the Book of Mormon this year. So if you're totally new, we are just, we cover all the books of scripture. And this year it's the Book of Mormon. And uh, we're in Mosiah 1 through 3 today, a message from on high. It's a little double double message there because of the tower and anyways. Everyone, whatever. David's so proud. I really am really proud of this title. Sorry, so. everyone compliment David and tell him that you love the title. He's going to be so proud. But these are fantastic chapters. Um, we're going to catch you up on where we are historically and then point out. Um, so you just kind of get your basis, your groundings for where you're at. And then a lot of like, I think some of the best teaching, if we call the Book of Mormon another testament of Jesus Christ. And I think it's cool to find the chapters where you were just like, oh, where, where do you see it? Especially in something that's like kind of an Old Testament text. Like we see in Isaiah prophecies about Jesus that are um, a little bit cryptic. There's other prophecies that are like their types and their shadows. But I think what you find in the Book of Mormon are these sermons, these messages, these deliberate teachings and prophecies about Jesus Christ by name. What is life going to be like? What's he going to do? And so I think you find today, um, today's one of those chapters. Yeah. And you get to Mosiah 3, one of the very particular, like, this is why the Book of Mormon has the subtitle, Another Testament of Jesus Christ. Mm. So some really, really cool stuff that you're, that you're going to love. Um, oh, P.S. This week, everybody, if you're interested, I filmed a masterclass on world religions. I love the study of other faiths. I love finding what's similar about all of us. I love the differences that kind of lead you thinking, wait, I want to be a better person of faith. I want to believe differently. So if you're interested in that, um, it's now available. I know I said something about it and then we've been getting questions when and where it's now. You can go check it out. Go to don'tmissthisstudy.com and it's under courses and um, you can see it there. And just so you know, because David won't say this, but he really is extremely good at teaching the world religions, like literally changes the way you see the world. And even like that little two minute trailer. Why? David showed me in the kitchen the other day. I like was like trying not to cry. I'm like, yeah, that's, that's really good. I'm like, that's really good. I, it really has impacted my fi- I studied world religions. I started teaching it, a course on it, the same time I was teaching the restoration. And it just was really good for me to figure out and see what's so unique and beautiful about the restoration while also admiring and seeing what's so unique and beautiful about other faiths at the same time. Like it just... The Book of Mormon is a a record that testifies God is the God of the whole world, Mm. right? Here I am reaching out to all these different places. I think another witness of that is world religions, that here's God moving and working among all of his children since the very beginning. So, okay, that was more than I wanted to say about it. (laughs) Because I have lots to say about it, but you have to go go to the course to see that. So let's jump in to Mosiah um, 1 through 3. Uh, This title I also am so proud of, but let's point out the tip-in. Remember, every time we start a new book in the Book of Mormon, there is a tip-in. These are um, at Deseret Book, everybody. And the ones that are at the beginning of the chapters sort of give you a table of contents for what you're going to find in Throughout the book, for example, it says like, oh, Mosiah 1 through 5 is King Benjamin's address. And Mosiah 8 through 9 is Ammon going to the people of Limhi. And Mosiah 24 is when they escape the Lamanites. And 27 is the conversion. So it's sort of like a table of contents and then highlights certain people and like who they are in one of their verses. So this, if you have these already, you want to slide those and stick those right into Mosiah chapter 1 where we are right now. Okay. Now I want to show you a little timeline I drew. And if you're just listening, I'm going to try and explain it as best I can, because this is last week, we didn't really talk much about the timeline and where we are. So let's fill you in. So back in the book of Omni, you found out in verse 12 that Mosiah was prompted in a a dream or vision or impression. I can't remember to leave the land of Nephi. So you remember Laman and Lemuel and Nephi split from each other after Lehi's death. And Nephi goes into this place called the land of Nephi. And they've been living there ever since that split that was in, what's that, Second Nephi 5, I think. They've been living down there. Mosiah is prompted to take a group of people, anyone who want to follow the promptings and the warnings of the Lord, are to leave. And he leaves Omni 1.12, and he goes up to a land that's called the land of Zarahemla. When he gets there, you find out in the book of Omni that they meet a group of people who have been there already. They're called the Mulekites. 
and he comes and he, they're named Mulekites, by the way, because the son of King Zedekiah from Jerusalem was named Mulek, and he's who led them out. That's where they get that name. So they left right when Jerusalem was falling. So similar to when Lehi left, but they, they haven't known about each other. And he gets there and finds them there. And they join up together and they become one people united with each other. Now, I want to read you what the book of Omni says. Uh, well, hold on. Let Pause. I'm going to tell you that in just a second. Because then I just want you to see this first on the timeline. And then we'll come back to that. Um, they're going to mention at the end of Omni that this little group breaks off of them and goes back to the land of Nephi. There's a guy named Zenith. We don't get his name yet in Omni, but we know that from later. And that's going to be the like people of Noah and Abinadi and stuff like that, but we won't get their story yet, okay? But they break off and you read that. And they're still living here. And then King Benjamin is going to be Mosiah's son, the next king. And he's going to give his record on, on the tower, okay? So can you kind of see that? That's... This is like big picture yeah, of big, the next few. Where we're at, right. So I want to read this to you about the people of... Um, Zarahemla, when they go up there and meet them. Back in Omni 117, we find out they had many wars and serious contentions, and their language had become corrupted, and they had brought up no records with them, and they denied the being of their creator, um, and they couldn't even understand each other. So Mosiah takes it upon them to teach them the same language, they can be united together as a people, but also, more importantly, maybe, to teach them about their creator. They'd become atheists, essentially. And the reason verse 17 gives for that is they brought no records with them, which is fascinating to me to consider and think about the power of Scripture in maintaining your faith and maintaining your belief. Because I want to think, oh, if for some reason all the Scriptures disappeared from the earth, you know, we could just pass it on. But I just, mm. it, this kind of just is a witness of how like essential to our faith it is to have a set of um, standard records that just maintain the integrity of, of belief and the integrity of faith, which you, you don't, you kind of don't think about that, you know, because we have them and they're online now and they're everywhere. And so you think we're never, ever going to live in a time again when we don't have scripture. However, we could live our lives without the help of Scripture, and maybe the same thing um, could happen to our own faith. Well, and that's such an interesting question, even just to think for like 20 seconds, is if I lost all access to Scripture in my life, would my life be different or not? And it just makes me want to think that if it wouldn't be, I wonder how different my life would be if I valued it like it would be, you know? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's like, wait, really cool I should just think. like sit for a second. And if that's not going to alter my life, if I didn't have them, I wonder if I could start using them like I needed them and I cherished them. And then I wonder if that answer would change, what that would look like. That's just a really interesting thing. I've never thought of that before. Yeah. And I think I called this section an inheritance of faith. And I'm going to come back to that idea. And I think it's going to connect to what you just said. Um, let's jump to the beginning of the book of Mosiah where, okay, so now we know what's happening because we had words of Mormon as that little break in between. So we're like, the storyline kind of stopped, but now we're continuing the storyline and they're in that land of Zarahemla and King Benjamin is, has now been king for a long time. So Mosiah left. We don't know a ton about his reign. We don't know. We're about to find out a little bit about King Benjamin's reign, but he's now old by the time we get to the beginning of the book of Mosiah. And he wants to confer the crown, the kingdom, to his son, who's going to be Mosiah the second. And so he's talking about in, in, in this area what he'd done for his own boys. Because it says in verse 2, he caused that they should be taught in the language of their fathers, that they might come to an understanding and understand the prophecies. And he says this line that I think is so cool. And now I've lost where that line is. Were it not for these things. Found it. It's in verse 3. It's the very next verse. Everyone's surprised. <laughs> and he said, He taught them concerning the records which were engraven on the plates of brass, saying, My sons, I would that you should rem remember that were it not for these plates, dot, dot, dot. And he's going to give a, a list. Kind of what you were saying. Were it not for the scriptures, what would my faith look like? What would my relationships look like? What would my choices look like? What would my whole life look like were it not for these things? 
And I love thinking about what are these things in my own life, the things that God has given to encourage my faith, to encourage my journey, to give me wisdom and counsel about the choices that I make, just how I'm so used to having so much here to help me that I think it's nice to pause mm. and think about, wait, man, were it not for these things, were it not for my friends, were it not for some of my teachers that I can mention by name, were it not for my patriarchal blessing, were it not for that blessing I got from my dad when I was 14, were it not for my um, priesthood leaders, were it not for the example, uh, you know, and just we can kind of make a list of what are these things in my life that have helped strengthen and maintain and encourage my faith and my hope and, and anything that I am doing on my journey. Like, mm -hmm. like even, how did I learn? Well, I'll get to that in just a second. Let's go to the next page and let me just show you this list. Mosiah mentions two of these things. One was back in Words of Mormon, and I just want to point that out since we're coming off of General Conference. Back in Words of Mormon in 17, he says, Behold, King Benjamin was a holy man, and he did reign over his people in righteousness. He learned that from his own father, by the way. And there were many holy men in the land, and they did speak the word of God with power and with authority. And then he says this in 18, Wherefore, with the help of these... King Benjamin, by laboring with all his might, body, and soul, did once more establish peace in the land. Mm -hmm. And I just think that's, isn't that cool? It's like, are you living with the help of holy men and women? Are, are you surrounding yourself with those uh, people of faith and people who are inspired? We get the chance to live with the help of holy men and women um, on a general church level and within our own circle of, of friends and influences also. Which would, like, I just can't help but think how cool it is that God was smart enough to play that same game clear back in this time mm -hmm. and in our lives right now. Right. That he's like, no, I am not just going to give you scripture, heroes and people to look to that, that like will guide your life, but I will also li like fill your life with people to enhance your spiritual experience. Right, and it's, the, it's that these things. Were yeah. it not for these things, my life would not look the way that it does right now. I mean, I'm even thinking, like, I, it, when I was giving that list, I mentioned a patriarchal blessing, you know? And Elle, my little Elle, just received her patriarchal blessing. And I walked away from our patriarch's house, and I thought to myself, how thankful I am for the kind of life he lives to mm. qualify for the inspiration that blessed my life and Jenny's life that morning as, you know, secondary listeners, but will continue to bless Elle's life for the rest of her life. Like the sacrifice he's making in his life right now to qualify for that inspiration, to be one of those holy men is like a, is an ever giving gift, you know? And it's just one example of who and what God's given us in our lives to live this way. I like that this is in the journal. This question is, what do you learn about the pattern of scripture um, from the beginning of Mosiah? But starting right there in verse two, all the way through, um, well, even beyond five, I ran out of room on the board here, everybody. <laughs> but just some of the things he says are included in Holy Scripture that we may not have thought of. And I think this could be a cool question before you look in the verses to think to yourself, what is in scripture that's so valuable? Like if someone had never encountered scripture before, and they came up to you and said, tell me why you love that book so much. What, is it, what does it actually have inside it? Mm. And what would you list and what would you say? And here's what, um, here's what, King, what Mormon says about you know, the scriptures at King Benjamin's time. He says, oh, in verse 2, he's like, look what's in it. Um, their language. They were taught their, their language was passed on through it, which I think probably means whatever language they spoke. But it reminded me of Lehi speaking the language of faith. Remember when we taught that in that time and speaking the language of hope and just what you have in here, just like the, 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 the language of belief uh, of people and the impact that that can have on you, understanding prophecies that are in here, uh, mysteries. Grace is going to talk more about like the mysteries of, of godliness and, and what that means. Um, I love in verse four, I circled the word help. That that's what they include in them. 
um, commandments in chapter five, things that guard your, your spiritual safety and your spiritual progression. Um, in verse seven, I'm in the wrong book. I'm like, that is not actually it. Um, in, uh, oh, in verse six, the sayings of our fathers, um, the things that are true. I mean, just imagine like just little one-liner phrases that just like the sayings of our fathers that have been passed down that you're just like, I will go and do. I mean, that's like such a cliche one to say, but it's just like that has inspired my faith. Nephi said it 600 plus 2,600 2, years ago, and I still like will say a phrase like that to myself at, and it inspires me or gives me courage or gives me direction. Well, and I love that when you know someone really well, you love the little phrases that they say. And those phrases, when said in other contexts, you're like, they mean instantly more to you because mm-hmm. you're like, oh, like my dad loves to say and things of that nature. And seriously, anytime I hear that in my whole entire life, I just like, no matter how serious it is, like I just like start laughing because it makes me think of my dad and I just love it so much. <laughs> and that's something that I think is so cool to think about in scripture that you get to know these people and the little phrases and they can mean something more to you, not just because you like saw the little quote on Pinterest, but because you know them and mm-hmm. you know their stories and you can connect to them. And then all of a sudden that phrase is like, wait, I want to live my life with this. Yeah. I want to be different because of it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That's awesome. Um, so in verse seven, he gives them this counsel, his sons, remember to search these diligently because this is what they have in them. And then one other in verse seven that I would circle promises. The, this is where you find the promises of the Lord. I Somebody um, in Who One Church last week said, um, hope is waiting with promise. Mm. And there's something about while I'm waiting on the Lord, to know his promises is different than waiting without them. Like, it might not feel like it makes that big of a difference, but it does. Because I've learned his character in here and his promises. And when I have those side by side, and I have evidences of when he's fulfilled promises in the past. So I have evidence of him fulfilling them, promises themselves, and his character. And just knowing that, I live my life differently. And it's cool because I think it gives you not just hope, but confidence. Yes. That you walk away from it, and you're not just hoping blindly, but you're confidently hoping. Yes, yes. This is a cool thought. Yes, That's yeah. That's really cool. I love that. Um, one last thought about that idea, the title of this inheritance of faith is, um, when I am considering like what are these things that God has given me to help maintain and encourage my faith, at the top of that, of course, are people. And it's interesting to think, um, like we can kind of make a, a, a genealogy list of where I came from, or like there's a priesthood line of authority that's like, oh, I, the priesthood came from so-and-so and then passed down to so-and-so and passed down to so-and-so. And, and I think that same thing can exist with faith. Um, often when somebody passes away, we receive like an inheritance, something that gets passed down and those become um, treasures for us. My, I have in uh, my house right now a little Winnie the Pooh uh, that was at my grandma and my grandpa's house. Pom Pom. I don't know why I just call him Grandpa. I've never called him that in my whole, <laughs> my whole life. Pom Pom and G. Um, this little Winnie the Pooh. And I loved it every time I went over to their house. Like it just was my favorite toy to play with. And um, what my grandmother, when she passed away, that's something that I got. I got um, the Winnie the Pooh. And I actually have him in a Ziploc bag because he smells like their house. And when I smell him, like it takes me back like to their house, you know? And that's like my inheritance, you know, from them. But I have a much grander inheritance, and it's an inheritance of of faith. And I like how King Benjamin talks about that to his sons, where he's like, I was taught, and now it's my responsibility to teach you. And I'm going to pass down the value of Scripture, and I'm going to pass down my faith in Jesus Christ. And I'm going to pass down my hope to you. And I'm going to pass down my joy to you. And I'm going to pass down what it looks like to live the thrilling life of a believer. And we are all inheritors of somebody else's faith. And then we get to pass that down as well. And I love being able to see this and I'm and thinking to myself, what are the lessons of hope and love and faith and grace that have been passed down to me. And just to think about like how awesome that is that God uses us in our relationships, in our families, in our friend groups, and in our church communities to, to pass down an inheritance of faith. 
And if you take that good of care of a tiny Winnie the Pooh, then how greater care are we taking like for those things, you know, like for joy and the, that peace and that knowledge that it's like, wait, like you, that is like a little tiny toy that if anyone else saw that, no offense, David, they would throw it in the garbage. Like they'd be like, why do you even have this still? And why is it in a Ziploc bag? <laughs> it would. <laughs> but I because see they what don't you're know. Trying. Because they so don't you're... know. <laughs> but like for you, you're going to make sure that that is like so well protected and taken care of. And you're going to do everything you can to preserve it. Mm. And I just think that is such a powerful thought that. What they're teaching you and these lessons, that's the most valuable things that they could have given you. Mm -hmm. Their peace, their hope, their love for the scriptures, whatever that is. And I don't want to treat those gifts lightly. I don't want to treat that inheritance lightly. I want to take care of it and I want to treasure it. And I want to put it in a little Ziploc bag so I can still smell it in two weeks. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. That's actually a really, really cool way to think about faith that you received as an inheritance. To like to to take care of it. I don't think I've ever thought about that gift, you know. And I don't want to. I I I don't want to treat any gift ungratefully. But I think it's cool that you're teaching like to see that hope and that love and that belief as a gift from someone else because it truly was. And sometimes we try to brush it off or like we're like embarrassed about it. Like oh like yeah like I just like always grew up believing this. And I'm like wait. Lucky. Yeah. I'm yeah. like. You sh- that should be like, you should be like, no, like you should get teary eyed and say, no, like I, I grew up with this. Yeah. Someone cared about it enough to teach me. That's what I was going to say, because there's like, you didn't just grow up with it. Like someone passed it on to you. Every yeah. inheritance was earned by someone else. You don't just like, oh, I'm just an heir to like, w- yes, to someone's hard work. But in a matter of faith, like you're heir, you're actually heir to like someone's um, prayer life. Mm. You're an heir to uh, someone struggling through a a trial and keeping their faith. You're an heir to someone loving the unlovable. Like just to think of the life of faith someone lived and then that's what they pass on to you. It's like it's rich. It's like it has like, it's like multidimensional. Just so cool to think about. Yeah, you don't need to be nonchalant about that and rub it off and act like it's simple. You can cherish it. Yeah. And it's keep cool. it and protect cool. it. Okay, hopefully y'all think that was as cool as we just did. We really like. <laughs> no, actually, to... we didn't talk about that, and now all of a sudden we love that. that yeah. Oh, so it's fine. Um, the next day is reading Messiah 2, verses 1 through 10. And we're calling it the mysteries because what happens is King Benjamin decides that he needs to address his people. He wants to give them one last, like, hey, let me tell you the most important things. Get everyone together. I want to stand, and I want to make sure everyone can hear me, and I want to tell them something obviously really important if you want to gather everyone to tell them. Yeah. And it's so interesting because I think the majority of the time on accident, specifically with this chapter, and even more especially when you just take the first 10 verses, I think we tend to focus on the how of that. Why are they, like, how are they gathering and what are they doing and da 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 And I think that's all important. I just don't think that's important unless you know the why. And the why comes at the very end of the, like, of this day's reading. And I just love the end of verse number nine so much because he's going to gather all these people. And um, he's going to say why at the very end. And he's going to say, open your ears that you might hear and your hearts that you might understand and your minds that the mysteries of God may be unfolded for your view. And I think that maybe when you start reading chapter two, you want to start remembering that. He didn't just get up there because he's like, oh yeah, like I have a few things that could be good to say. Like I have like a few like announcements. He got up Mm. there and he said, I want my people to know God. I want them to know and discover and figure out things that they wonder about or they don't understand or they're confused about. He wanted them to get to know God. And then all of a sudden, these first 10 verses come to mean so much more to me because now it's not just like a group of people gathering together to like listen to someone who's like going to stand on a tower. But now instead, it's one man saying, listen, let me teach you how to get to know God. Hmm. Let me help you figure out how to get to know him. And then when you go back, all of a sudden, the lessons are like, 
I can't get this out of my mind. Like I like read it on a flight and I like read this chapter, like these 10 verses, probably for 30 minutes straight over and over and over again because I thought it was so cool. Because I think that's something that the majority of people, and when I like think about the kids that I teach and the kids that I talk to and my friends and the people that I know and I'm surrounded with, I just can't help but think about how many of them right now are just saying like, I just want to get to know God better. Mm. I want to know him. I want to learn about him. I just want to get closer to him. And on accident, King Benjamin's going to tell you how right now. And he's just going to describe what his people did. But I think it's a really good lesson because first what happens in verse number one, the people gathered themselves together that they might go up to the temple to hear the words which King Benjamin should speak. And they were a great number. And I love that the very first thing I like in my margins wrote a one next to that. And I just like wrote gather together. Mm. If you want to get to know God, gather with people, get together with them, sit next to them, surround yourself by them. And I just think that's such a cool first step that it's not even like asking the question yet. And it's not even like anything. It's just so simple. Oh, just find people, surround yourself by people that will help you get to know him better. Mm -hmm. And I just love that they're going to camp. I don't know if they're actually camping, but they have tents. So in my head, <laughs> everyone's going to say they did not have a campfire. They might have. We don't know. Okay, everyone. They did. They made see? burnt offerings. Yeah, the see, it's true. It's Evidence. fine. And they had it all. They had it all. And they I just it. love that. I think that that wins me because I think so many of my favorite conversations happen at a campfire mm -hmm. when I'm camping and there's nothing else to do and you just sit around and you talk. And I think those conversations just, for me, automatically foster a conversation about God. And I love that that's what was happening to King Benjamin's people. He said, go get a tent, make a little fire and sit around with all of your favorite people and get to know God together. So if you want to get to know God, that's my first thing. Well, and I was just going to say, uh, we have like, we go to dinner every Sunday night at my aunt's house and we have ever since I've come up here to, for school. And Jenny and I affectionately call it Sunday night church. For that very reason, because we sit out on the back porch and sometimes Sunday school hits and sometimes it doesn't hit, you know, like you just can't force yeah. a spiritual conversation. Like there's things you can foster and get, don't get me wrong. But for some reason, like just some of my most faith promoting, um, like my uncle last week just said, when President Nelson talked about, let's have home centered church supported faith, you know, it was just like, I I've seen that. And like on a back porch or around mm. a fire, you know, where you just gather together. And I just am a witness of that. And I think there's something real. I'm, it's really cool that you found that because it's so valuable. Yeah. And I really, truly do think that talking about him is one of the ways that I've gotten to know him the best in yeah. my life. And because you're talking about people like, where have you seen him? How has he fulfilled promises in your life? You're, you're you know, someone essentially becomes scripture another book of scripture for you. Mm. Just like they become another testament of Jesus Christ. Yes. Like this is where I've seen him. This is what I know about him because of this, this, and this. And you're so much likely to talk about not just your like surface level questions, but maybe the reason why you're asking those questions with people that you know and you trust. Yeah. Uh -huh. And I love that that's giving you permission because I think sometimes we think that the question is the end, but you're asking the question for a bigger reason. Yeah. There's a root to the question. And mm -hmm. I love that I think people get that out of you. And so he said, first, let's get you surrounded by people that are going to help you cool. get to know God better. Because then you're not just asking questions. Then you're like getting to your heart mm -hmm. and to your soul. Yeah. And then what's going to happen after that is in verse number four, is they also started giving thanks to the Lord. And this verse is so cool because it's going to go through and it's going to list in the majority of the verse, like probably 80% of the verse is what God does. He brings them out. He brings people out of the land of Jerusalem. He delivers them out of their hands of their enemies. He appoints just men to be their teachers and a just man to be, like, be their king. He establishes peace and he... Um, taught them to keep the command. Like they had someone that like taught them how to keep the commandments. And I love that he gives, like that gives you a list. And maybe if you're like on that mindset that you're like, okay, I want to get to know God. And you're like, okay, I got to find my people that I want to like have these like after church, church moments with. And then the next thing I love that he's just going to give you like a here, here's a place to start. If you need to remember why you should be thankful for mm -hmm. your creator. And maybe you need to think about the things that he has like brought you out of. 
What has he saved you from? Or maybe you need to think of the moments and the times that he's delivered you. Or maybe you need to think about the people he's appointed in your life that have blessed you and helped you and taught you. Maybe you need to t- like think about the moments when he's established peace in your life. Where has he brought that? And I love that establish is a word that means like he brought it and he started it in that moment. Yeah. That it wasn't like he, like in a moment that maybe you wouldn't necessarily be able to find peace, he established it there and then like just I just love even like the words like taught them I just think that's a really cool thing to think about what have you like what has he taught you what have you learned you can be thankful for yeah Yeah. they're like you're like oh that like wins my heart and in the end of that verse it just says that they might rejoice and be filled with love towards God and all men yeah that's the result if you want to fall in love with God start being thankful try discover what he's doing. And I think that's the reason why is because I think when you're grateful, you start thinking about more specific things that God's doing in your life. And when you see what God's doing in your life, you cannot help but love him. And I just think that's a really beautiful moment that he stops and he's like, no, like I can teach you a lot of things, but once you start seeing what God does in your life, he will be less mysterious to you. Yeah. And I like that you're just, I just want to connect this back to what you taught about that verse nine where it's like, open your ears that you may hear, your heart that you may understand. That, that initial line is intriguing because open your ears that you may hear and no one actually opens their ears. Yeah. They're always open. You can open your eyes, you can open your mouth, right? But your ears are always open. So it's a way of teaching you like, yeah, they might be kind of technically open, but you have to tune in a little bit. Yes. And the, you're teaching the ways that people do that. You want to open your heart to God? Gather together with people of faith. You want to open your heart to God, start the practice of, of gratitude. I don't know about you, but I think the practice of gratitude, both things that you've said, I love that you're teaching. No, this. and I've why is this the best deep, thing yeah, ever that no you didn't even know yeah, was in yeah, here? Because both of those things already have had a wildly significant impact on my faith. To gather with other people, to talk of faith, and to be grateful. Like, I, those are like one and two. They've yeah. got to be. No, I know. And why was he so smart that he this just figured awesome. it out? Yeah. And then what's going to happen in the end is everyone starts coming and they get their tents, which you just love because I love that they're having a little camp out together. <laughs> and everyone gets their tents and they start going. And then they realize like, well, we actually don't have enough space for all of this. And so he's like, how is everyone going to hear me? And so they build the tower and then he's going to stand on top of the tower. And he's like, I'm going to preach to all these people. And then all of a sudden people are like, wait, we want to make sure that we hear him. And so they turn their tents towards him. And then they're like, wait, we still can't hear you. And he's like, I'm going to write it all down. I'm going to write everything down. We're going to send it out. Everyone's going to be able to hear the message. And I just can't help but think that maybe that was one more way that you could get to know the mysteries of God and who he is, is putting yourself in a place to hear him. Mm. And that might look like a tent. And that might look like maybe theoretically, like you want to like build this in, like that might look like a temple, a holy place. And I love that some people were there physically. And they heard the words like firsthand and they could hear him and they were front row for the message. And some people just turned their tent and they still showed up and they turned their tent and they could maybe just hear like the echo of him. And then there were some people that even just got the readed cop, like the readed copy. Yeah, that's fine. It's written. <laughs> you know, written. the written, the written <laughs> copy. And um, I think that's the same way when you think about places to go to hear him. That maybe there's some places that you really are going to show up physically and you're going to hear him there. And maybe that looks like a church pew and a chapel in your neighborhood. And maybe that looks like a couch in the middle of the temple where you're going to sit for a couple hours. And maybe you're going to go to those places and you're going to say, no, I'm going to really hear him. Um, But maybe some other days, it's just going to look like turning your tent toward him. And maybe rather than going into the temple for three hours, that just looks like driving by and parking in the parking lot for five minutes really quick and having this moment with him. And maybe that just looks like going to like your place and going on a bike ride or a walk and just saying, I need my heart to be turned to you. I need you to like, I need to be getting closer to a place where I could hear you. And maybe on other days it's saying, you know, what? I'm pretty far away from that, but can you bring your word to me? And he does and he will because he did right here. And I just think that that's my favorite part about these 10 verses is that if you want to get to know God and his mysteries, he's going to show you how. He's going to say, gather with your people. They will help you get to know him better. Be thankful. You will see him working in your life and you will fall in love with him. 
and start putting your place yourself in places to have conversation with him. Yeah, I think you might want to circle at the at the in verse one, right towards the end, just those two words go up. Just I think that's what you were what you were just teaching. Like mm -hmm. be deliberate about turn or and then the phrase turn your tent. Those are two I think really cool phrases that kind of latch on to like just like go up, like separate yourself from the world for just a minute. Turn your turn your mind and your heart and your ears toward heaven for for just a minute. That's and I really love cool. that there could be three different ways of hearing him. That maybe sometimes it's going up and maybe sometimes it's just turning your tent and maybe sometimes it's just the written will be Breathing. sent forth among you. Yeah. That he will send it to you. That's awesome. That's cool. Um, we're going to find a little bit about in this next section um, about what King Benjamin was like as a person and as a, as a king. Um, I'm really intrigued by this uh, because of the royal language that we use as Latter-day Saints. Um, one example of that is um, to be in the order of Melchizedek or to receive Melchizedek priesthood ordinances. Um, that word Melchizedek is royal, Melech Zedek. It means king of righteousness or a queen of righteousness. So to be a recipient of Melchizedek priesthood ordinances is, to, is a call up to live as kings and queens. And so when I see the life of a king here, um, I, I, I love learning what he was like because it almost gives a pattern for this is how to live royally. The royal law of love, the royal law of, of holiness, the royal law of service. And I just, there's something that intrigues me about that when I read it. Um, and he will talk from verse 11 all the way to 16, 17, 18, 19 about what kind of king that he was. I, I'm like you, um, in, I'm subject to infirmities, body and mind. I was chosen. I was consecrated by my father. I, I served with all my might and strength. I, I never sought riches from you. I, I never put you in dungeons or anything or made you slaves to each other. I taught you how to treat each other so that we could have a nice, peaceful place of living. I labored with my own hands to serve you so that you wouldn't be laden with taxes. Like I was right there down in it with the rest of you. Um, Jenny's grandpa was a bishop in Hawaii back right after Hawaii became a state and lived there and was called as a bishop. And he had this nickname of being the taro patch bishop because everybody was picking the taro plants and the taro roots like out in the fields and everything. And he would go out with them and be in the dirt with them pulling the taro plants. And so that's what they called him. Mm. They were like, oh, some who didn't even know his name, they called him the taro patch bishop because that's where you could find him was in mm. the fields with, with people. And that's what it makes me think of. And then as I read it a second time, is when I gave it this, not title, a king like Jesus. Because then, and this might be something you want to do starting in verse um, 11. Um, what do you see that King Benjamin learned from his king, King Jesus, on how to be a king? And I think you'll mark and find phrases like this. I was subject to all manner of infirmities, body and mind. Um, I was chosen by this people. I was consecrated by my father. I was suffered by the hand of the Lord to be a ruler and a king over this people chosen by him, anointed even. I've been kept and preserved by his matchless power to serve you with all the might, mind, strength, which the Lord hath granted unto me. I've spent my days, verse 12, in your service, and I haven't required anything from you as payment. 13, I suffered that you wouldn't be confined to the dungeons of, of sin and addiction and fill in the blank. I, I've taught you to avoid wickedness. I have labored, verse 14, myself with my own hands that I might serve you. I love thinking about hands that are marked on the Savior with that love and with that service. Um, and in 15, I'm not telling you all these things to boast because gl glory be to God in everything that I have done. And um, I love seeing a type and a shadow of King Jesus in King Benjamin. And it's kind of neat to do that little maybe exercise with there. It's like, where do you see Jesus mm. in King Benjamin? One of my favorite verses and probably yours too, that King Benjamin taught from that tower and what it looks like to live royally um, is verse 17 when he talks about this service where he just says, 
I spent my days in your service, not to boast, for I've only been in the service of God. And this is one of the great spots in scripture where it shows us how personally God takes it when he sees the way we treat other people. Where he just says, when, when you acted so compassionately to that person, God says, I took that personally. And he teaches us in 17, I tell you these things that you can learn wisdom, that you can learn how to live the good life, that you may learn when you're in the service of your fellow beings, you are only in the service of your God. Our word for the week um, poster that hopefully you'll hang up in your house and just remember this throughout the week, like um, to know that serving other people is the way that we serve God is makes service so empowering to me. And I like that on every one of these posters, um, look at the de- dictionary definition yeah, of it. what? To spontaneously perform something for another's benefit. I'm going to come back to that because I can't help it with what the worksheet is in mm-hmm. a minute. But there is a cross-reference to my favorite set of scriptures in all of scripture, Matthew 25, 40. And that's those verses when, um, when Jesus tells us, this is what I will care most about on judgment day. The question, did you love people well? That is my number one concern. And he'll say to a group of people, come, you blessed, because when I was hungry, you gave me meat. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. When I was naked, you took me in or or clothed me. When I was a stranger, you took me in. When I was in prison, you came unto me. And they will answer back and say, when did we ever see you in any of those things? And Jesus says, when you did it to someone else, it was as if you did it to me. And there is something about that that is that, that captures and grabs my heart. Um, that it feels like Christianity at its finest and at its core. What it looks like to live as a king is, is to come down from the throne, to be in the tarot patches, and to serve and, and, and love and lift other people. I got this picture mailed to me um, from an artist and she wrote the story of this and, and it's a it's a sketch of the face of Jesus. And she said that for years I never painted or or drew the face of Jesus because I, I didn't I it was so daunting, it was so intimidating. How do you draw and what does it look like? What what do you even like? Who's the model, you know, for the for the face of Jesus? And and she ne- had said I'd always wanted to, but never could, because I never knew how to draw his face. And then she said, one night I was, had such bad congestion and like a cold symptoms. And so I went to Walmart to go get just cold medicine. And she said, I pulled into the parking lot and saw that there was a, a homeless man who'd set up with like shopping carts and everything, a little shelter for himself in the parking lot for the night. And she said, it was cold. And I was so headachy and so congested. I was like, oh, I wanted to kind of just, I don't have time for what's happening here. But she said, I felt compelled to go back home and go get my homemade quilt that was such a, a treasure to me. And I got it and I brought it back to the man and I gave him that blanket. And he just looked up at me in the eyes and said, thank you. And she said, I'll never forget that face. And she said, I went and got my cold medicine and I went back home and I came back the next day and there was that quilt that was folded up in the spot that was just left there. And she said, when I went to get it that next morning, that face flashed in my mind again and I knew I had seen the face of Jesus. And so that is the painting that she did was of that man's face. And I think that story encapsulates what this verse is, is saying, is she saw the face of Jesus in the face of another. And when we serve and when we love and when we lift other people, it's as if we are serving and loving and lifting him. So our worksheet That's for... That's the most tender story of all time. What Don't in you the love world it? is even happening? It just... Um, yeah, that principle to me has always like been so sweet. Like it's always like informed my faith in such powerful ways. And 
The blanket all folded up. Why did he not take the blanket? I know. But that whole story. So sweet, right? So look at the worksheet in the journal, or you can get them in the email, right? You guys, this um, is the best worksheet ever. I am... Listen, I'm most proud of the title. I'm most proud of King Benjamin. I'm most proud of this. <laughs> this is David's best episode. Everyone really just my let class. Him, let like him it's know. My class. It's my day. Um, this is just a little spot where you can keep track of... Remember on the poster where it said, Webster's Dictionary in 1828 said, to serve is spontaneously perform something for another's benefit. And... This is, I think, just a cool thing you can hand out to a class or for yourself or copy it for every week of the year. Yeah. And it gives you a spot for the date and a location and a box of where you served God by serving someone else. And it just feels like a little service journal. And just for it to be out on your desk is a reminder um, to make that a priority as a, as a person of faith, as a follower of Jesus Christ, it becomes a priority for us. It becomes the privilege for us to serve others and God at the same time. And, and, and you can plan. I like that it can kind of be spontaneous. Like you come at the end of Monday and you write, this is Monday's date. This is where I was. This is what I did. This is Tuesday's date. This is where I was. And this is what I did. And if you're a teacher and you're like, wait, I, what, how am I going to do this? I think it would be so cool. Even like if you can the week before, or like for me in seminary, I want to give this to all my kids on Monday and then have the lesson be on Friday. Cool. And just be like, hey, fill this out throughout the whole entire week. Explain it just a little bit. Have the lesson and then say like, hey, this is what's happening. And maybe you want to do that the week after. Like teach this whole lesson and then give it to them. I also or you think, can do it the week before. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Either cool. way. And I also think it would really be cool too to just like sit down and just be like, I want you to think of some a time that someone served you. And just fill it in like that. Awesome. And I think that could be awesome. a cool lesson that all of a sudden at the end, everyone's going to have at least four things to say. It's cool. So. So many ways to use that, but I just love it. And your tender mercy, you forgot. And that is, the, you guys, I'm the hero of the, this, this, this is section. Your big, is like, this is your big day. The poster is the worst day for David. It's the tender mercy. Um, those, the tender mercy is those that God has given to serve us and the opportunities that he has given us to serve. So it's like a two for one tender mercy that I might serve you is what it says on there with the little tower for King Benjamin. So you can remember the story as you go through. So either slide that into your scriptures or... Put it on your Mercy's poster as that tender mercy for this week. Perfect. All right. The next day's reading is Messiah 2, 22 through 32. And it we're calling it, it belongs to him. But what's, I think that's something that's really interesting about humanity in general. And maybe it's just my humanity, but I think it's maybe in general is I think we're kind of a payback people. And not like evil payback, maybe like that too. I don't know, but like we're like payback. People. <laughs> well, we are because listen, I realized this this week that my favorite movie is Count of Money Crystal. <laughs> Wait, I don't. I've never even seen it. Grace, I'm sorry, everyone. The episode's over. Grace <laughs> now has to go watch this movie. It's ridiculous that you have not seen that movie I'm sorry. right now, I'm sorry. and you didn't know about a George Foreman grill <laughs> last yeah. week. But you guys, it's been a tough two weeks okay. for me. Um, it's all about revenge. The guy gets revenge. So like what you're saying, like maybe we're not like an evil payback, but sort of because like you're really happy when he gets revenge. Because you're payback. like, you're cheering him on. <laughs> yes, like, yes. Yes. Okay. Sorry. And it really does feel like we are a little bit of a payback people. And if you doubt me, you should see if you have the Venmo app and you should go through your Venmo because that means you are a payback person. Like that is what it lives off of. It's like, oh, I'll like pay back next time or I'll bring money, I'll pay back. I'll then money, you, I'll pay back. Or like, even like if you have like really good friends, you like play the game of like, I'll pay this time, you pay next time. And then that's like your payback. But we're kind of like a checks and balances people. Yeah, for sure. That it's like, no, make sure you pay me back. And there's some people that care about it a little bit more than other people and whatever, right, but it's right. still like inherently there's some part of us that really cares about payback. And, and even if somebody does something nice for you, you like will say like, like oh, good payback. Yeah, say like, oh I'll get you, I'll oh I owe you. Yes. Right. Like if you bought me lunch, it's not a thank you. Right. It's like a, oh now I owe you to make sure that we're even. Yeah. Mm. Yes. Yeah. One hundred percent. And what starts happening is there's this moment we're gonna go in reverse a little bit into David's section. We're gonna start in verse number nineteen of chapter two. And what happens is he says this one line at the end of verse number nineteen. Oh how you ought to thank your heavenly King. And then he's like gonna go on this like three verse rant about how good our heavenly king 
is. And the more you read it, like it, seriously, I like wrote excuse you in the margins of my scriptures. That is true. And it has four hearts next to it because these two verses, you cannot believe how lucky we are to have the king we have. Yeah. That's all I can think when I read it. You should render all your thanks and praise with if your you should, whole yeah. soul. Oh yeah. That you should. That if you should. Um, with your whole soul, everything that like your, whatever your whole soul can contain, all of that. I need every single ba- bit of that to the God who has created you and who has kept you and preserved you and caused that you should rejoice and has granted that you should live in peace with one another. And then he's going to keep going and he's going to say, um, he created you from the very beginning. He's preserving you from day to day. He didn't just create you, but he is going to be with you every single day since by lending you breath. That's your evidence, in case you wondered if he was really going to be there. Every single breath you take, that's the evidence that he is. That you will live and move and do according to your own will, even supporting you from one moment to another. He will not just be there, but he will have his arm around you, walking next to you. Mm -hmm. And if you serve him with all... Like, after you read that, you get to know this heavenly king, and you're like, he is really good. Kings are not usually the type of people that spend the day to day with their people. Yeah, I was going to say, like, usually the more money, popularity, or power you get, the more distance you are, the more inaccessible you are. That's how I want to say it. The more power, money, or power, what did I say? Power, money, yeah. Prestige, yeah, yeah, whatever. Great. Power. The more power, money, or prestige you get, the more inaccessible you are. Think about the really popular people on Instagram. If you DM them, they won't DM, DM you back. You can't write the president of the United States a letter. Like, he's just not going to get it. Like, a secretary is going to reply, right? The more, pa- like, kings usually are inaccessible. They're in a throne room. Right. Like it's like, and they have a castle and they have walls and a moat. And like, it's like, is, and that, protocol. is it called a moat? Even? The water? Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. <laughs> like it is like, you cannot get to them. And he said, no, 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 wait. Your king is good enough that he will be arm in arm with yeah, you. Yeah, that's cool. And every single day. And by the end of those two verses, you can't even believe how lucky we are to have a king like that. Mm. that it is like, what in the world is even happening? Like you are, you, you're like, okay, great. And then it's almost as if he knows about the payback part of our soul. Because he's going to say, if you served him with your entire soul, you would still be an un, like you would still not be a profitable. 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 Thank you. Servant. Like no matter how much you do, like you are still not going to be profitable. Why is that word so hard for me? We don't know. <laughs> don't it's know. fine. Um, but, and then like all of a sudden, that's when you hear the payback tone of voice. It's like, but wait, but like, if he's going to do that, I need to do something. If he's going to be that good, I must need to be better. If he's going to be that type of king, I have got to be a better servant than the one I'm being right now. And then what's going to happen is verse number 22, we usually read out of context, but the more you read it in context, the more you're going to love it. Because what's going to happen, he's like, you think that you have the commandments to pay him back. And he says, listen, all that he requires of you is to keep the commandments. And then all of a sudden our payback mind is like, oh, that's how we pay him back. He's this good. So we must pay him back with the commandments. That's and he's how like, we get even. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. like, okay, then I'll do that because he's so good. I'll be this good. I'll do all the commandments. And then all of a sudden he's like, but you forgot that he has promised you that if you keep his commandments, you will prosper in the land. And he never doth vary from that, which he says. So just so you know, if you do keep the commandments, he's going to prosper you. And then all of a sudden our payback minds start seeing a problem with that. Because if you read 22 by yourself, that matches. You're like, okay, I'll keep the commandments. He's going to prosper you. But you forgot what he did in verse 20 and 21. Yeah. He He already did. And now you're like, okay, I'll keep the commandments. And he's like, no, 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 wait. He is going to bless you on top of that. Plus, like, I, I think this makes, like, commandments become synonyms for gifts in 22. Yes. Also, where you're just like, oh, the, but the commandment was a gift. He yeah. He showed you how to, a life hack. He yes. showed you how to live on this world in a way that avoided danger and led to progression. And like it's going to was... be better and better and better. Right. <laughs> you're getting more and more and more good. And so you're like, no, 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 I'll be better. I'll be better. And he's like, but he will keep getting better too. 
No matter what you do, he will be more good. That's just the truth. The more you keep the commandments, you are going to realize, oh wait, I like I'm not keeping the commandments to keep up with God. I'm keeping the commandments because I want to be close to him. Mm. Because he will just be better. He will just be more good. And that is not something to despise yourself about. That is something to worship him for. Yeah. And say, wait, I cannot believe that I'm a mess, but I get to believe in someone like him, that I get to do life with someone like him, that even what he asks me to do, he will make good. And even like after he says that, he's like, listen, he created you from the very beginning. He did it all. From day one, he granted unto you your life. You cannot repay that. It's too late. And if it wasn't, look at everything he's done since. Everything, even from your creation, is him. It's like, that's not even you. You can't even say that like, oh, I have my own life. It was his first. He was your creator. And I love that it says in verse number 25, you cannot say that you are even as much as the dust of the earth, yet you were created of the dust of the earth. Like you, like he's like, you... He created you. Even like the very like small, you can't even like compare yourself to like, I'm worthless. I'm nothing like, it's just like, I can do my own thing. No, no, no. He turned nothing into you. That is him. Like even that part of you is good because of him. And I just love that at the end it says, but behold, it belongeth to him who created you. You get to be his. The reason he is that good, the reason he blesses you so much, even more than you could ever deserve and way more than you could ever pay back is because you belong to him. Mm. We're just so lucky for us. And and, and I actually love the idea of because we have that payback part of our soul, like it's a big celebration when you pay off your car debt or after 30 years when you pay off your mortgage because nobody likes living indebted to somebody else. Like if I pay back my student loans, it's like, oh my gosh, I feel free. I'm not indebted. And, I, and he uses that word indebted, which has like a, a vibe to it of like, oh, I actually hate living indebted. I don't want to have that burden over me all the time. But I just love that his invitation is live indebted to God. Like, and just have a mind switch. Like live indebted means to live in gratitude. Like don't pay him back. Don't score keep with him. Live in, all he wants you to do is say thank you, mm. right? That's it. Live in thanksgiving is what it, that's what it means to live indebted to God is to live in thanksgiving. Mm. And I think if we like, we'll think about that. But also what you just said, that's what I was going to say is living indebted means like, oh, he owns me. And I actually want, I don't want Bank of America to own me, but I do want God to own me. Hmm. You know, and I'm, I'm okay with that. Yeah. You know, that's a good place to be in. Yeah. The, and, and now as he keeps going into this next spot, um, we're calling this one, which spirit, because in that verse 33, 32, he just says, but oh, my people beware, lest there should arise contentions among you and you list to obey the evil spirit that was spoken of my father, Mosiah. So he's just gone through and explained, this is what your heavenly King is like. But he's explaining, but everyone is obedient to a king. Like, we all are obedient to some spirit. Um, I was telling Grace before we started that one time my bishop, when I was younger, said to me, for someone who doesn't like being told what to do, you sure let the devil tell you what to do all the time. And I was like, true, but ouch, at the same time, (laughs) you know? And it just taught me a lesson that we all have a king. We all have someone that we look to for our life advice, for how to live the good life, for how to make decisions. We all are looking, and that person might be ourselves. We might be looking to ourselves, but you know, and he's just saying, we're all going to list to obey some spirit. And he's just outlined what the heavenly spirit is like. He's like, don't you want him to be your king? He's down in the dirt with you. He's arm in arm with you. He's lending you breath day to day. He's a giver of wisdom and, and all, like, but he's like, we all list to obey some spirit. And I like that he just talks about in 33, the wages, the wages of that spirit that you list to obey. And he talks about, this is what happens when you listen to the, to the voice that's in rebellion. When you listen to the voice of the destroyer, when you listen to the voice of the adversary, the fruits of that are that you die. They're death, right? They're, um, they're, 
damnation, which is the opposite of progression, right? He says, when you live contrary to the law of life, the law that's contrary to the law of life is the law of death. I like when the scriptures will use phrases like this, because sometimes it seems like God is kind of willy nilly saying like, well, I made up this rule. And if you don't obey it, like, sorry, but rather he was giving us like the laws and the patterns of life. I mean, the patterns that lead to life so that we can avoid what it naturally would be chaos and, and destruction. Here's how he words it in verse 36. He said, I say unto you, my brethren, after you have known and been taught all these things, if you would go contrary to that which is spoken, you do withdraw yourselves from the spirit of the Lord. Sometimes the language of scripture is that the spirit withdraws, but I think this is more helpful language. You withdraw yourself from the protection, the promise, the grace, um, the help of the Spirit. You say, I, I'm moving myself away from it. Because we've learned about a God who's anxious to help, anxious to be involved, comes out of the throne room, but we've withdrawn ourselves from him. And then he says, and, and that means that he has no place in you to guide you in wisdom's path, that you may be blessed prospered and preserved. We're not talking about mistakes here. Verse 37 makes that clear. And he says, we're talking about open rebellion against God, listening to obey another spirit, becoming an enemy to his law and his personality. That's what we're talking about. We're not talking about somebody who's like trying to navigate this life, listening to the spirit and dealing with temptation and weakness. We're talking about someone who's like, no, I want to, I'm rebelling that and I want to live a different kind of, 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 of law. And I just made this list in my journal when I was writing that, that just like God's taught us the law of honesty. Well, what would be the opposite of that? And then what would be the fruits of my life if I lived opposite of honesty? And what would be the fruits of my life if I got rid of loyalty, God's law of loyalty? And I said, no, I want to live in a law of, what, I, what's the opposite of loyalty? What would the word Unfaithfulness be? Unfaithfulness. Yeah, yeah. What happens if I live unfaithfully? Like, what's the fruits of that? What's the opposite of self-control? What if I live that law out? What if I live out the law that's opposite of love? And I just sow the seeds of hate everywhere I go. Like what is going to grow out of that? And God is saying, no, I want to preserve you from the chaos that the devil is trying to sow into this world. And not only preserve you and keep you from it, but I want to help you to progress. Which leads me to this last thought I just want to give because he uses this word several times throughout his sermon. And this is a word we find in the Book of Mormon a lot. And it's the word prosper that you see in verse 36. And I made a little list here for you. And this might be kind of cool in some of the blank pages in the back of the Book of Mormon. To every time you learn what it means to be prospered by the Lord, this is a really cool study. And this section is a great place to learn it. We learn that to be prospered by the Lord means to live with his wisdom in verse 36. We mean it learns that it, we, that it means, <laughs> yeah, I'm okay. We're making it that you'll be preserved by him in verse 36. I actually like how 113, Mosiah 113 says that a little bit better where he just says, um, I say unto you that if this highly favored people, the Lord should fall into transgression and become a wicked and adulterous people, the Lord will deliver them up. They become weak like unto their brethren. He will no more preserve them by his matchless and marvelous power. So he's talking about stepping away from his, you know, protection. Um, in verse 36, we learn that we get his presence. That's what it means to be prospered by him is to live in his presence, to do life with com companions, with the Holy Spirit. Um, we learn that to be prosperous means to live in his promises, to know about them and to be recipients of them. Because as we taught earlier, even knowing about his promises does something to the confidence in the way that you live. That's what it means to be prospered. Another is back in chapter one, verse 17, um, to be prospered means to live in progress, to be um, continually progressing and moving forward in our lives. So um, this is what King Mosiah is saying. Listen, which spirit are you going to list to obey? Because the spirit of the heavenly king is trying to get you to obey the laws that will lead you to this. Mm. And I think it's a cool study. You're going to keep 
seeing that word over and over and over in the Book of Mormon. You and have so, already in these three verse in these three chapters. It is in there so many times. Right, right. It's a way closer. And I, I get that question cool. a lot. Like, what's he mean? Because our minds want to go to a material prospering. And you're going to find some evidence of that, that sometimes God will bless our careers and our lives, but it's not the only way that happens. And I think that's... You don't need to get stuck on that. Right. If you're not seeing that, God can still be prospering. Right. Because I just listed five or six that are not that, that are coming up throughout the Book of Mormon. Yeah. Um, Our very last section is Mosiah 3. It's called an angel's message because what's going to happen in chapter 3 is that an angel is going to show up, which is the luckiest news ever. And my favorite thing is that angels love to show up and say the same thing, which is kind of cute to me that I just think there's like a language for the angels. And Mm. what happens is the angel comes and he says, listen, I need you. First of all, they always wake him up, which is like, oh my, okay, cute. Mm. He says, awake and hear the words, which I shall tell you. This is verse number three in chapter three. For behold, I am come to declare unto you the glad tidings of great joy. I have come with the best news. That is like, that to us screams Christmas, which should automatically in your heart win you over. You should already be having like, oh, I love glad tidings of great joy because you think of Christmas, which is perfectly fine. You can. That is exactly what you should think about. And I love that he says, listen, I am going to make sure you know the good news. And I think it's so interesting that the gospel, we always like translate that to be good news. And people yeah. talk about it all the time. And we almost use those words like interchangeably, like the gospel, the good news of the gospel, the good news. And it's so funny to me because I think that there's often been times in my life, especially growing up, that I was like, why is it good news? Like what mm. about it is the good news? And I think that chapter three answers that question. Why is it good news? You just read chapter three. You're going to find out. And that's the study I did in this chapter this week. And it won me over instantly. And I just wrote on my margin of chapter three, um, why is it good news? And then all of chapter three, the only thing I marked were just the reasons why I could consider this message from that angel to be good news. What about this chapter sounds like good news? What about this chapter screams glad tidings of great joy? And if you wonder if the gospel is good news, this is a good place to start. Yeah. If it doesn't sound like good news to you right now, maybe read chapter three and see what you learn. And you, like, David was like, should we make a list? And I was like, yeah, the whole chapter. So sorry that we didn't make a list. <laughs> you guys, this is the list. Great stuff. <laughs> it is. Me. It's done. You guys, it's just chapter three. And you're going to see it everywhere. Like already in verse five, he's going to come down with the children of men. He shall dwell in the tabernacle of clay. This part already, there's like eight in this working mighty miracles, healing the sick, raising the dead, causing the blind to walk to the lame to walk and the blind to see and the deaf to hear. You go down a little bit further. And all of a sudden it's like verse number eight. He's the creator of heaven and earth, the creator of all things from the beginning. And his mom's going to be called Mary and everyone like you have faith on his name and on verse number 10 on the third day he's going to rise again after his death and verse number 11 is going to be he's going to be atoned for you and verse like you go through all of this and all you can see is good news yeah over and over and over and i think that's just the case with the story of jesus the more you study it the more good news you find yeah and i cannot help but think that that angel must have been on the edge of their seat that night and said oh i cannot wait I cannot wait to tell him the good news. And the more you read it, the more I think you would want to be that exact angel and say, wait, I, this is such good news that I cannot keep it in. Mm -hmm. When you have really good news, you want to tell the whole entire world. And I think once you read chapter three and you're going to highlight all sorts of things, all of your very favorites. And and can I just, before you like Mm -hmm. conclude, let me just throw in. A, th- a little help for this chapter that there are some scary verses that seem scary, right? That it's like, oh, 18, like, oh, there's damnation and there's perisheth and there's like fire that's going to come later and abominations yeah. and the wrath of God. And I just want to go back to that list and just say like, mm. God didn't come to send people there. God came to save people from there. So every time you read what looks like a scary verse, the way you want to read that is, oh, that's good news. God saved me from what I could turn my life into. 
the disaster I could create. I mean, think if you led, if you lived the opposite of all those laws and we all did, it would be hell. Yeah. It would be wrath on this earth of our own creation. So when you read those, let me, a little tip that when you read those scary ones, it's like, oh, see that as good news. God gave me a way out of my own selfishness, a way out of my own lying habit, a way out of the chaos and the hatred and the trouble I could very well cause my own life and the life of other people. Hmm. Like he's a saving God. He saves from those verses. That's maybe a good tip as you go. Okay. Then you're going to be, yeah. yeah I just just like, throw that little... And I think that's the coolest part about it is that when you hear something like that, you're like, and your heart is like, oh, like I get it. Like, I love that. Actually, I don't need to read this and be afraid. I think that is why it's called good news mm -hmm. is because when you hear something like that, just like the same with news, you cannot help but share it. Yeah. And you cannot help but be like, wait, I need to tell everyone about this. I need to make sure people know. I need to go and knock on doors and I need to go scream off of rooftops and I need to make sure everyone knows. And I love that chapter three is good news that comes from an angel because I think it gives us permission to bring the good news to other people. And I think there's still room for angels and there's still time for the good news. And you just better, yeah. you know? Absolutely. Oh, and I think if you missed it, I think what you were saying, what a great way to like teach this chapter or, or study this chapter is to give that these, that verse, these are glad tidings of great joy. Find them all. Yeah. Mark every single one of them. And then that pass it on verses 20. Oh yeah. Good. I, just, I lost it. And I said, well, okay. yeah, you <laughs> close the book. It's 20. I say unto you, the time shall come when the knowledge of a savior and his good news shall spread throughout every nation, kindred tongue and people. And we're here to just say to you that the time has come. It's here. Pass on the good news. Pass on the message of Jesus to every nation, kindred tongue. Start in your own friend group, in your own home, in, in camping sites and, and wherever you are. Or go to San, San, I forgot your Sacramento. <laughs> I was trying to say your mission. Sacramento. Yeah, or go to Sacramento, Sacramento. or Korea or Mozambique or oh. Denver or, or wherever and, uh, um, or Instagram and spread the good news mm. of Jesus. Because it is good. Yeah, it's so good. That's the truth. Amen. Okay, y'all, we'll see you next week for part two of King Benjamin's message on a tower, his message from on high. Get it? <laughs> <laughs> the week.